Don Cobine. And what's the earliest hop festival you remember? Uh, 31, 32, and, 1930. Yeah. And what was it like down here then? Oh, you were here in the hop bowl? Yeah. Oh, wow. It was clear full of carnival. All around here, clear down, around. And of course, this was all back of the buildings here. The town was completely full of people. That's what I remember most of all, is just uh, lots of people promenaded around, up and down the streets here. Was just thousands of people. Beer joints were all full. They were all completely full. People outside lined up. The old theater down the street here, the old Lissus, was uh, the set. The first and second showing both people would be lined up for a block to get in the old movie. And uh, cost us a nickel apiece to get in. Town full of people cashing their hop tickets. It was quite a time. Oh, uh, all the old rides, Rod, you know, just had wrestling, Bulldog Jackson. <laughs> I worked with him on the river later. Uh, I remember watching him when I was a kid down there wrestling. The old rigs you hit with a hammer, you know, the old guys would be hitting that thing all the time. The cop camp was empty, you know, come to town. Horse Company was a big one, Wigridge Ranch, Whirline, Alluvial, all those uh, camps across the river, walkers, all the hop farms over there. They'd buy grocery with their tickets. And you could go in a beer joint and take a hop ticket, buy beer, whatever. But uh, the whole town, everybody accepted all the hop tickets, no matter where. You could always tell the, the card, the different colors. You could tell what ranch they were from, you know, like horse company, Louisville, or people working. It was a good time. The d depression was on. It was a hard time, but for a while, everybody had a little money, you know, for picking they could buy groceries. Never seen anything like it after that. that. That went on, I remember them up to the 40, well, when the war started. I can remember all those from about 1931, 32, through all the 30s during the Depression up until World War II. Uh, and then the machines came in and they didn't need all the pickers, so it kind of faded away just faded away. Our hop festival went away. and Over the course of a number of decades, a number of other industries slipped away. The hops went. Timber industry was in decline. Our downtown started slipping over a number of years. But then, at the beginning of the 2000s, we had a downtown renaissance. There was a new investment in our downtown in sidewalks and build-outs and repaving. Our community was investing in itself and businesses were looking up. And through all of this, there was a new energy that took place in our community. We decided to take a look at where we'd been, what we'd done, cheering for our heritage, and what could be there again. I was lucky enough to be able to recruit some really wonderful community leaders, people who wanted to get things done, and together they brought back the Hop Festival. The Hop Festival was a wonderful idea, and they put it to life. Now, when all of this was happening, there was a little bit of a backdrop. The downtown renovation was still underway. The road was not yet paved. They'd torn it up and replaced sewers and water underneath. And two days before the hop festival was slated to begin, we hadn't had the paving down. But the night before, our contractors were able to get the first layer of asphalt down so that the hop festival could take off. I think you also have to remember that in 2001, our event was scheduled in 2001, right after the September 11th bombings. And there was questions by some whether we should continue at all. But the committee and the folks in our community decided that we needed to celebrate what was good in America, the great things that we were really proud of. And so the Hop Festival went on. It was a wonderful event and one of the most touching moments was in downtown. There were hundreds, if not thousands of people down there when we kicked it off with somebody singing the national anthem. 
And with the backdrop of what had happened in New York and around the world, there was really a, a wonderful heart-moving time that was just an unbelievable moment. An unbelievable moment in the all-American city named for what is really important in America, independence. It's a great place. It's a great festival. It, rec it recognizes what we have going in our community, and we're really proud of it. A year after our first hop festival, which was truly an unqualified success, despite the date that it came off on, we, uh, John mentioned having uh, some concerns about it being only 18 days after the 9-11 tragedy, but I want to expand just a moment on what he said when he came into the meeting right before the festival on the Tuesday after all of the, the uh, towers were bombed and all of that horrible stuff went on. He didn't come in and give us a rah-rah speech. He came in and said, if you stop this festival, the sons of bitches win. Don't let them win. And so we went ahead with the festival. The second year, in 2002, we started the Ghost Walk. And the Ghost Walk was started because there had been so many stories about downtown independence and houses and buildings and streets and alleyways that were that were haunted that we decided it was time to capitalize on enjoying some of the nightlife other than the folks who came down and visited in downtown Independence. We did a little bit of advertising for the Ghost Walk. We expected, hope, I was hoping for about 30 or 40 people. I would have considered that a success. We had three places that were willing to be on the first Ghost Walk. There were no ghost hosts because we were just going to send our tiny group from one place to the next and let the host tell the stories, let the owners of the building tell the stories. Well, when I got downtown, there were a lot of people milling around, and I thought something must be going on. When I got to our first stop, which was the Masonic Lodge, there were, and we counted them later to make sure this was true, there were 310 people waiting to take the ghost walk. So I took half of them up into the Masonic Lodge, which filled it to capacity, talked to that group, sent a runner ahead to the next stop, who warned them that they were going to have a rather large group coming to hear their story, and another one following them. And that is the way we conducted the ghost walk on the first night. It is now going to be in its 11th year. We have a thousand people plus come to town for the ghost walk. It is still a free event. We now have 30 plus stops on the Ghost Walk. Some of them are historical, some of them are anecdotal, many are haunting stories. And I have to recruit a group of about 50 volunteers every year to help with this because it takes a lot of ghost hosts to, to take a thousand people around town. We, so far we've had mayors, we've had city councilors, we've had county commissioners who have been hosts for the ghost walk, we've had newspaper people, and I'm always looking for more. And if you see me sometime between, the, between July and September, probably my first words will be, what are you doing the last Friday in September? You're probably wondering what a ghoul like me is doing in a place like this. Come and find out at the annual Independence Ghost Walk. Specially trained hosts will take you through time to meet a few of us who visit you from there. If you don't have a crystal ball, visit us online. See you Friday night. Big fun. Big fun. We always have fun. Um, been doing it about seven years. Um, I've been here in Independence about 10, and uh, it's always a good crowd. Um, we get a little bit of everything in here, little kids, really old people, um, people from way far away as far as Seattle. I've had a couple of people from Seattle come down. Um, it's a great tour. Um, we've had to split it up into two different halves now, so that it's... Uh, you know, if you go through one year, you might as well come back the next year and take the other half of the tour. Um, got some great history in here, some good ghost stories, and everybody has a good time. Thanks. And if you want to come on tour number three, let's go. Okay, can I sit? Do you mind if I sit? <laughs> go for it. Oh, okay. Do you want the... So, 
<clears throat> so the little girl, the story of the little girl, it, it comes over a, a whole long period of time. The first people that came to do any kind of paranormal investigation was Rain City Paranormal. Little local group, nice people. Um, and when they were in the building, they picked up on um, a little girl, a, a mean old man, and a pinched, a, a very a small, tight, pinched old lady. You know, like very proper. And um, so that kind of, ex oh, and they got an hour of footage of something moving downstairs. And I kept saying, well, that looks like somebody skipping, you know. Um, and I guess they didn't really pick up on the girl, that, uh, the people that t at that time, the first time they came, we just got that, this movement footage. So the next time they came is when they picked up on all the, the, the three entities in the building. And then um, they came again, and that was when um, they actually heard, they got audio where um, they were sitting and talking, and, and the man said, uh, the mean old man, they're pretty sure said, you know, told him to get out. Mm -hmm. Get you could hear get out. It's like oh, so then um, the little girl. Um, some guy picked up on this little girl, and and he said that she she was um, about six or seven, maybe eight, and that there was a doll in the building that she really loved and she was upset because she couldn't she couldn't get to it or she wasn't allowed to play with it or or if it was a room she couldn't go into or something like that. So, you know, if you fast forward, you know, about five years, um, these two ladies had come in one day and, and you know, most visitors will come in and, and they'll look at exhibits and they'll talk about them and stuff like that and they'll be together. Well, when people come in and they separate, it's like, okay, here we go. Yeah. <laughs> the side chicks. So they come in and they separated and, and they were telling me um, about more about the man and, she, and I said, the mean old man? And she said, oh no, he's not mean. He's irritated. Okay. He was, he was stationed somewhere or he was away somewhere for training and he, he was looking forward to coming back and taking some girl to a dance. And so I don't know, um, we still don't actually know if he took her to the dance or not, but she picked up on a nickname for him was of Barney. But we couldn't figure out, she couldn't pick up on the year that he was at war or where he was. So I'm waiting. I said, if it comes to you, call me back. So then um, and the other lady said, she was talking about the little girl and how she likes to play hide and seek and she's very playful. And, um, and then she started to leave and she goes, oh wait, I want to show you something. She goes, she loves this doll. And she goes and points at this, this doll in the pink dress in the parlor on the little rocking chair. And I said, oh my gosh, that makes perfect sense because she's not allowed to play in the parlor back in the old days. And those kinds of dolls were only made for older kids, you know, 18 years old, 16, 17, 18 years old. And they were just pretty to look at and they were usually made by an aunt or a grandma or something like that. So they were special to look at because they have porcelain hands, head and feet. And... Um, I can tell you by experience, if, if you're under the age of 16, you're going to break them. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, so that, that helped a lot. And so more about the little girl. <clears throat> a boy was in here one day talking to me in the office, like I started out talking about. And, she, and he said that or as he was talking to me, he was looking down the hallway, down to where like I keep my coffee pot and stuff. And he was kind of looking. He goes, oh, whoa. And I said, what? And he says, I saw the little girl. She was looking right at me, and then she realized I could see her, and she and she ducked back. So she kind of ducked this way, and so he kind of walked back there, and he said, "Man, she's she's good at hiding." And so he was kind of walking around in here, and he and he said he felt her touch him, come up behind him and touch him, and then he turned around and he said he couldn't he couldn't sense her or see her anywhere. So he had a lot of fun. He said she is so good at hiding, and she's so playful. So he picked up on. Um, that her name, he picked up on Isabel, so we don't know if that's really her name, but Isabel came to him, um, that I, that she's very playful, she's got a sad aura around her, and, um, I asked him if he knew, you know, what happened to her, because she was so little, and he said that she, she was terminally sick, 
and um, she's very respectful and mature for her age, and she's loving and caring. So that was kind of who you are and what you're doing here. And this is our director, Teresa. Hello. Um, I'm the graphic designer and photographer, Patrick, and this is uh, one of our IT members, Amanda. And we are at Lord of Society. Oh. I'll leave it to the director to speak. <laughs> this is actually our first year hosting the Ghost Tour. We're really excited. It's a huge opportunity for us. Um, they said they were just going to help lead the tours around through town and talk about some history and some of the ghost stories that go with them. Yeah. Um, we did a bunch of uh, investigations around here, so we'll be talking about our own experiences. We did the Raging Rivers, we did the Elks Club over there. We have any pizza lined up. We have a few residentials. We did here at the museum. Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's pretty much it. Yeah. Uh, just informational, I guess. My name is Mike Gambino. I'm from OFER. Uh, OFER stands for the Occult and Paranormal House of Investigational Research. Uh, we're based out of Salem, Oregon, but we travel to where everybody needs us. Uh, conduct paranormal investigations on all levels, not just ghosts, but claims of uh, cryptids, you know, like uh, Bigfoot sightings and whatnot, uh, alleged UFO sightings, abductions, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, if anybody out there needs us, you can contact us through the website. That's www.teamofer. That's T E A M O P H I R dot com. Thank you. What is that? And you're doing a ghost host tour this time. We are. Okay. We are. This is Bernard Powell. He's going to be a, a ghost host this time around. So is this your um, first time doing something? This is my first time hosting a tour. Yeah. Music is my only job these days. <laughs> which is Natasha Cronin. I am the Rogue Hopyard Manager and I've also uh, helped this year on the Hoppin Heritage Committee. Uh, Rogue's been involved with the Hoppin Heritage Festival for uh, the last several years. Uh, we always have the beer garden and uh, we help with the sponsorship. And uh, this year we're also having sponsoring the homebrew competition. It will take place here uh, in, the, in the beer garden. It's a great opportunity for Rogue to be involved with the local community. We really enjoy being part of independence and helping as much as we can. And, uh, it's also a way for people to learn about our farm right outside of independence so they can come out and, and visit us there and see where the hops are grown. <laughs> Last year we sold a record number of vendor spots. We have, uh, we have a five block area that's closed off and Two of the five blocks are dedicated to other uses, so there are literally three one-block distances that we fill with vendors. In the past, our vendor high, our, our sales high for vendors has been about 62. Last year we sold 91 spaces because people just kept calling and saying, please let me come to this, and we kept finding more and more room for them. So at about 4 o'clock or 4.30 in the morning, I come down with my chalk and my rope and I measure out vendor spaces which are 10 by 10. It's done in the very very dark early morning and sometimes I have to wait for carfuls of people who are going out to work. Usually there's a, a, a bus or a carpool group that's on its way out. I have to wait for them to go by. The streets aren't blocked off till about 6 o'clock in the morning. So it's a, it's a dodge game from four to six. And the vendors who are supposed to be coming between seven and 10 in the morning begin arriving about 5.30. And it's, uh, I was thankful last year that I had a sheriff on hand. Drew Dillon was my sheriff and I just gave him the list of vendors that were coming and said, oh, by the way, these two you need to collect money from and let him go and he did a marvelous job. This year it's taking two people to replace him because he was so good. I'm Aaron Weimer and I do uh, the parks maintenance setup stuff. Uh, I think we did about a thousand plus most of the time uh, for the weekends. Wow. And then on our uh, one of our other events we do we get like 20,000. So very very nice event. Pretty laid back actually.
real easy going. What's your biggest challenge doing these? Uh, making everything fit into one time because everybody wants everything done at the same time. <laughs> but we manage. We do real good. So if somebody came from another town and said they wanted their town to do it, what would your advice be? Run? No. <laughs> no, uh, advice would be coordination is key. That's, that's the biggest thing. And you keep it, it's never going to be on time. Hello, I'm Dave Martin. I'm a member of the Hoppin' Heritage Committee and I was invited to go along on one of the balloons uh, flown by a pilot named Mark Trujillo who uh, is the leader of a group of four hot air balloon pilots this morning. We took off from the airport right before 8 o'clock and went uh, nine miles south and uh, had a really interesting flight. The landing was nine miles south uh, just off Arley Road and uh, one of the four pilots was a woman, owns their own uh, hot air balloon, and two of the balloons were experimental, that is people uh, sewed their own balloon envelopes at home. Hey everyone, welcome to the first official run on this new trail. Hi, I'm Sean Gatherum. I'm the race director for the Hoffman Heritage 5K. This is our second year running this event, the first year here on the new uh, Independence Running Trail, um, which we've built over the last year. This is my daughter Anna. She's the coordinator of. And this is your uh, senior project. And this is her yes. senior project. It's going amazingly great. Got lots of sponsors. And... So we have a couple hundred people registered to run, or not a couple hundred, but 120 people registered to run today. Um, we have the mayor here on hand, who's going to cut the ribbon to open the trail. Um, as a permanent fixture as part of the community and so we're really excited to do that. This is the inaugural run here on that on that trail. <laughs> I'll look like I will be large and easy to see. <laughs> thanks so much and thanks for your efforts for this. This is really wonderful. And I hope you know, we'll get a good grade in our senior project. That's good. You're always on. <laughs> That's okay. Now, that, so this was your secret project. That's great. What a wonderful run and what a wonderful way to, to kick off this whole event, this whole facility. And she's only a junior, so she's really off and running in effect. That's wonderful. That's good. So you do a good job. You like the run you like running on the trail? It's good. It's a little better than like the sidewalk. You've been so instrumental in all the running that's going on right now. Would you introduce yourself? Okay, my name's Al Opliger. Uh, actually, I was involved in the very first mini marathon back in 1973 and served as the chairman on and off uh, through the years. My wife Jane took it over uh, and was the general chairman for the mini marathon for eight years, and now she in turn has turned it on over to Terry Cable, who's doing a very fine job. The numbers, participants, is swelling for the mini marathon. But uh, Jane and I are also involved in the Willamette Valley Roadrunners, who are the coordinating sponsors of about eight different events here in the Mid Valley, including the Mini Marathon, and now today the second annual Hop Heritage Festival run. Uh, we're very pleased that Sean Gatherum and his daughter Anna have, have taken over and are again organizing this year's Hop and Heritage run and on this new course, which uh, is exciting for the young runners and uh, the possibility maybe that even some of the runners from Western Oregon College will come over and do some of their training here for their cross-country runs. So it's going to be well utilized. Uh, come on down it's just by the dog park. 
and uh, today's a beautiful day for the first official runs. This is the 500 meters by eight children ages six and under that just finished. Soon we'll be starting the mile run, and then at uh, 10 o'clock the f first 5K uh, will happen here. And the ribbon cutting. And the mayor's here to do the ribbon cutting also. Okay. Thank you. Predator on the course. Down the hill. <coughs> The mile event will start at 9.20 at the start line. 9.20 for the mile. Be ready. Here comes the first runner. Finish line are the two towers back here. Alex Trevino. I'm actually involved with the uh, uh, the River's Edge Summer Series and uh, um, I've been uh, coming to Hoppe Heritage uh, Festival for uh, for numerous years now and and uh, it's a great event. Um, used to actually help out when it first started. Um, it was kind of the uh, litter patrol way back in the day when they needed volunteers but I've been absent but uh, actually this is one of the first years I've actually come out here to enjoy it and they've done a phenomenal job um, uh, the, the Hoppin Heritage uh, Board has done a great job putting this event on again this year and I'm just happy just to be here to enjoy it. I'm John Whitmire and I'm opening up the Independence Hops and Barrel House this October hopefully October 13 but as you can see it's things are coming along nicely and steady. How long have you been in this area? I've lived in Independence about 10 years, and uh, I just fell in love with my first house here and fell in love with the town. Barrel houses back in the day were kind of a place where regular Joes could go, you know, tap a barrel, hang out in the barn, drink, have fun, be merry, play bands, would come. Really homey place for everyone. Just I'm Marie Trickle, I'm the executive director of the nonprofit Small Business Incubator in Independence. This is my third year of doing the Hoppin' Heritage Festival. I was on the committee and was put in charge of the information booth. What we're doing different this year is we have some people that are going to rope the crowd and have aprons on that say, ask me for information about the Hop and Heritage um, event so that strangers that might be in town and aren't sure where to go or what to do or what we're offering can, can get the information that they need, sort of hospitality at the event. 